well, my book uncovers correspondence between Bernays and the National Institutes of Dental Research. Uh, Bernays was asked to come to Washington by the NIDR to help create their PR campaign to sell fluoride to the nation. Bernays understood that people have an unconscious trust in their doctor or their dentist and if you can persuade doctors and dentists that fluoride is safe and good then you're, you're, you're uh, able to reach the rest of the nation. People believe they're doctors and dentists and that was a way of promoting fluoride for Bernays. Very few dentists are aware that the fluoride in public water supplies is not a pharmaceutical grade product. It is in fact an industrial waste. It's the uh, waste from the Florida phosphate industry. In the 1950s, the Florida phosphate industry was being sued by farmers and citizens living near those plants because of the fluoride that was killing their cattle, destroying their crops. You know, the Florida phosphate industry today is prevented from having to dispose of its industrial effluent in a toxic waste dump by the device of shipping that in tanker trucks around the country and dumping it in our water supply. From the beginning, opposition to fluoride has been uh, equated with uh, you know, believing the earth is flat or being against the United Nations. Opposition to fluoride is equated with quackery or, or, uh, or paranoia. Uh, and in fact, that's, uh, that's really a media smear. In 1950, the public health endorsed water fluoridation. Almost immediately, there was a national movement against fluoride, and that was led by Dr. George Walbot. We should all know George Walbot's name. Uh, he was the first physician to warn of the dangers of allergic, fatal allergic reaction to penicillin. Walbot warned, was one of the first physicians to warn of the dangers of emphysema from smoking. He saw in his own uh, surgery, in his, his practice in Detroit, Michigan, uh, that people were coming in with these uh, ailments, unexplained ailments, whether it was back pain or gastric distress, uh, muscle fatigue, uh, headaches. Uh, and he figured out that it was low-dose fluoride. That, as with a lot of drugs or chemicals, there's a small subset of people who are uniquely allergic to the chemical, and Walbot realized that it was fluoride, and he performed uh, a whole series of double-blind experiments uh, where people were given some fluoridated water without knowing it, and the symptoms recurred. And very quickly, Walbot's name, rather than being seen as this giant of public health, committed to safeguarding public health, uh, somebody who'd warned us about penicillin or uh, tobacco, suddenly George Walbot becomes this marginal fringe figure who uh, is, uh, is criticized for his opposition to fluoride, and that's something that takes place again and again and again. Speaking out as a doctor or a dentist against fluoride is, is, is the third rail. Uh, it's, it's fatal to your career. Uh, we don't know George Walbot's name because he was smeared by the Public Health Service for his opposition to fluoride. In the uh, 1990s, the senior toxicologist for the EPA's Office of Water said that the cancer tests that had been done uh, on fluoride, where laboratory animals were given fluoride, uh, he said that those results had been gerrymandered, that in fact the equivocal verdict that fluoride was a carcinogen ought to have been much stronger. He said that uh, fluoride given to rats had produced bone cancer and liver cancer and that those results had been doctored to make it look as though fluoride hadn't caused as much cancer. I didn't the toxicology business looking at studies of this nature for nearly 25 years and I've never seen that never ever seen where every single endpoint that was a cancer endpoint had been downgraded I'd seen one or two endpoints argued over usually on a definition of what is a cancer in that particular tissue but I've never seen every one of them downgraded I found that very suspicious Marcus was fired Dr. William Marcus was fired and a federal judge ruled 
that Marcus was fired because of his outspoken opposition to fluoride. The first two chapters of the book are, relate the story of Dr. Phyllis Mullenix at the Forsyth Dental Institute. She had helped invent a new technology for studying the neurotoxicity of chemicals. Uh, it was called the Computer Pattern Recognition System. And uh, in, in essence, uh, Dr. Mullenix's uh, technology uh, took uh, photographs or video of animals uh, which had been given a chemical in small doses and then used computers to analyze uh, the patterned behavior or the disruptions to patterned behavior when the animals had been given uh, that, that chemical. While Mullenix was brought into the Forsyth Dental Research Center to study the, some of the chemicals used in dentistry and she was asked to study fluoride and Phyllis Mullenix said, uh, I'm not wasting my time with fluoride. Fluoride's given to children, it's good for children, it's been down, ra around for donkey's years. I'm wasting my time by studying fluoride. Uh, but she did as she was ordered. And, uh, and Phyllis Mullenix found that fluoride in very modest doses produces effects in laboratory animals resembling attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. The pattern that we saw it typically is what we see with other neurotoxic agents that are well known to cause a hypoactivity or uh, a memory problem or an IQ problem. When I first presented the results of these studies, um, one of the uh, individuals sitting and listening to the results, he says, do you have any idea what you're saying? And he says, you're telling us that we're reducing the IQ of children. And basically I said yes. She went from being an industry-funded, leading neurotoxicologist at a Harvard-affiliated research institute to being a voice in the wilderness. She has not received any grants, uh, nor any academic position as a research scientist since her opposition to fluoride was made public. The Center of Disease Control says that water fluoridation is one of the top 10 public health achievements of the 20th century. How can citizens deal with something like that? A question authority. You know, for years and years and years and years, the public health establishment told us that lead in gasoline was safe. We know today that children's brains were damaged, were injured, by uh, the addition of lead to gasoline. Uh, you know, the implications of this new documentary evidence, the implications of these buried medical studies, which are, which are now in the public domain as a result of my book, as a result of uh, you know, the medical work that's been done by people like Phyllis Mullenix, uh, the willingness to speak truth of uh, toxicologists like William Marcus, the implications uh, of that research, uh, of these new findings, is that something is terribly, terribly wrong and we have been led very far astray and it's time to change. But that change will only come as a result of uh, bravery, as a result of the willingness to invest time. You know, I, th I think it's time to, to speak up, to speak loudly, to get organized and to fight for change. I hope you'll enjoy me in expressing fear and selfishness. We will embrace tyranny and death as a cause and a creed. We can be summed up in one word, evil. I am committed to defeating not only the good work of charities, but the values that will bring lasting peace. And we have a great opportunity during this time of war to lead the world. This is the test of the emergency bombing system. This is only the test. <laughs> Let's roll. This is a test of the emergency bomb hit system. The bomb hitters in your area and voluntary defiance of federal, state, and local authorities have developed this system to keep you informed in the event of a bomb hit emergency. If this had been an actual emergency, the attention signal you just heard would have been followed by official supply information, blue scanner news, and emergency bomb hitting instructions. This concludes this test of the emergency bomb hit system. Wake up, America.